Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Uncovering the Redback Report. Today is all about the what, the why and the how. We've conducted the research and now we're bringing the results to you. My name is Isa, I'm an employee of Redback Conferencing and I'll be your facilitator for today's session. I would now like to welcome our presenter for today, Marketing Manager at Redback Conferencing, Sarah Gonzalez. How are you today, Sarah? I'm well, thank you Isa and thank you everyone for joining today's um, very special webinar. Um, I just want to give you a brief, a brief overview for those of you who didn't join us last year, just on the Redback Report, what it is and what we're actually going to get into. Um, so this is the second year that it has been run um, and in 2013 we embarked on this journey to uncover the Australian conferencing landscape um, and what it really did, it provided us with insights and intelligence uh, into the way that online audience Online audiences attend, interact and engage with webinars and webcasts. Um, so I hope everyone today is familiar with the concept of a webinar and a webcast um, because we're going to jump right into the findings um, and talk about some of the fascinating facts. Um, what we found is it's absolutely amazing how much difference an entire year can make um, and you know we found you know, online events are still quite early in the adoption phase, um, but virtual attendees are becoming much more and honest with their feedback and they're expecting a lot more from online events. Um, last year people really spoke a lot about the importance of increasing interactivity and engagement, um, whereas this year you'll see through some of the findings um, that while this is still considered quite important for many, um, things more like on-demand recordings, um, making sure that your presenter is prepared as well as sticking to a and stuff like that really topped the wish list of many people attend, um, who completed the report. However, um, we like to say that the more things change, the more they stay the same. Um, so there are a lot of things that have changed, um, have cha stayed the same, sorry. So really talking about accessibility, um, when people like to attend, why they like to attend and how they like to attend. Then we're going to go through the opinion pieces, so uh, really outline the advantages and disadvantages and hopefully that will help you tailor your online events. Um, big baggage questions, so the questions that everyone wants to know the answer to um, but really very rarely come out. Um, and then we also, um, we're going to have some fun with some polling towards the end and talk about what's important and what's necessarily not important to some. Um, and then we'll be able to see how your responses stack up with those who completed the report. So let's get started and I believe we're going to jump into a poll, Liza. Yes. So um, we just want to basically understand how familiar you are with webinars and webcasts. So just launching that poll now. Great, so really just get an understanding on everyone online, um, how many online events you have attended prior to today, so whether it be a webinar or a webcast, um, maybe quite familiar with how they all work, so over 10, maybe you have attended none and this is your first one, in which case welcome and we hope you enjoy. Um, but this is really just to get to know people online um, and hopefully that will help us tailor what we're about to launch into now. Um, and we can see those results coming through now, Isa, with around 40% of people saying under 5 and then the second highest is 34% of people over 10. So. Um, it's good to see people are familiar with the service, so that's um, that's great. Um, if we do speak it out anything that you're not really familiar with and you're like, oh, does that really make sense? I don't really know what you're talking about there. Please feel free to use the chat box in the bottom left-hand corner um, and that way we can respond to your questions as they come through and then also have some time at the end. Great. Okay, we're going to talk about the respondents now um, and the people who actually did complete the survey. So um, just a bit of an overview. Um, so we talk about sector um, and there's no surprises here when we compare this to last year that the not-for-profit um, and association sector are the largest. Um, they're the people who do predominantly use online events within the people within our community um, so there was no surprise there. Um, corporate and government also came in quite highly with the people that we actually surveyed um, but what we found is compared to 2013 there was about a 15% increase with those in the corporate sector using online events events and about 12% in um, government as well. So just a bit of an overview there, just um, regarding the people who completed it and it's great um, that we have Aussie members online when we're talking about the not-for-profit association space. 
And just industry in terms of a breakdown, um, healthcare and medical and education and training were part of the biggest chunk as you can see there. So we actually have um, 23, just over 23% of people within the healthcare and medical space and then 21% education and training. Um, is quite an average breakdown of everything. Um, and as we go into the statistics and the findings, um, this will make more sense um, because with education and training, um, a lot of the uh, responses really circulated around that as well. Um, and just we just want to find out also um, how long people spend online. We're talking about online events. So we really wanted to get an understanding of what people's online usage is, just whether it be in their working days or whether it actually be in their home environment because that obviously is going to play into you hosting your online events and who you're actually um, tailoring or who you actually want to hop online. So what we found here is that it's obvious that a large chunk of our working day is still spent online. So 26% of us we found were actually glued to the computer screens for around the four to eight hours. Um, so it's no wonder that people are becoming um, obsessed with the convenience of these online forms of communication. But what does it really mean for you as people out there who are trying to engage with people and bring them online, whether it be for membership purposes, educational purposes, or even just to inform people? We think it presents opportunity, obviously. Um, you know, there's so many online channels available when we look at social media, um, email marketing, websites. Um, you do have the ability to engage people on so many online levels now. Um, so we think you know, using these types of channels is obviously going to appeal to people, but obviously being creative in how you do it, um, and as we'll go into shortly, um, just making sure that you're really specific on your audience there. Um, and then also access as well. So um, no surprises here. We actually found um, access in the internet during work hours. 12% um, of people, we actually saw a 12% increase in laptop usage at 37%. Um, but we do want to stress, and some of the findings and some of the responses that came back is that people are accessing um, mobile devices a little bit more than previously. So really considering when you are promoting your online events? Um, are your emails responsively designed? Um, are the registration pages that people are registering um, through accessible on a mobile device? And is even the webinar that you're presenting or the webcast you're presenting accessible to those people online? Um, so just a bit of an overall um, view there, just on the access and how people are accessing your online events either. All right, so now we've got the respondents covered. Let's get into the nuts and bolts of online meetings and events. So why do people attend online meetings and events such as webinars and webcasts, Sarah? Well, the people who we um, actually surveyed, they came back with this um, and the highest part here is professional development, 25% of people. Um, and obviously no surprises considering that these people were the ones um, we had 65% or something from the not-for-profit um, space. Um, and then we can actually also see that a high percent of people are actually um, also partaking in these types of events for uh, personal development as well as learning and education as well. But as we can see, professional development really up the top there. Um, as people, as online events, webinars and webcasts become more prominent in the corporate space, I think we will see product launches and business meetings become a big part of it. Um, but a lot of people also said to us that you know they're starting to use online events, they've been using them for so long within the professional development space, now they're bringing them for internal communication, so board meetings and business meetings as you can see here. Um, and in terms of how often these people like to attend, um, we actually, this is actually quite interesting what we can see here. Um, so the findings, in 2013, we actually saw 30% of respondents said they attended webinars on a weekly basis. That figure has actually dropped now to 18%. Um, so as you can see, when we're looking at, there we go weekly. Um, on the other end, we've seen a 50, we've seen a 15% increase in those partaking in online events on a more regular basis monthly. So 49% of people are attending events, online events, on a monthly basis. Um, and we can we can just give a bit of inside information here with our clients and people who are partaking in professional development events, most of them are run on a monthly basis as well. Um, so that also ties into the question that was um, held here before. 
So this really tells us um, that you know the use of webinars and webcasts as a key educational tool is definitely on the rise. Um, but it's important to note that they are becoming more common, and competition is going to also be on the rise as well. Um, so once again, if you are hosting monthly events, um, making sure that they are it's really consistent, it's really regular, and also being aware of what your competitors are doing. Um, you know, webinars are very, very everywhere now in the online space. I know we use them a lot for personal development here, even internationally. We attend a lot of international webinars and we probably receive around 10 to 12 invitations a week just for marketing webinars. Um, so really, if you are going to launch into an online event program, really being mindful of the fact that people are attending them quite regularly. Um, so you always need to find a way to sort of stand out from the crowd. Um, and just a question from Mike and Tess. Um, so, sorry, we didn't actually put that in the slide beforehand. Um, but professional development, we just had. If you if you belong to a membership organisation, um, is it compulsory professional development where you're actually um, gaining points from, as opposed to just learning and education on a regular basis? Great. Uh, so now we know the why and the how, but let's just try and understand the advantages. So a little task for all the participants online now. Can you please type into the text box um, what they find the main advantages of online events? So tell us, tell us the advantages. Yeah, so if everyone can just type into the chat box um, in the bottom left hand corner, what do you find the main advantages are of online events? Um, and it will be interesting to see if these actually stack up with what the respondents said. Um, so we've got ease of access, convenience, um, the ability to reach regional Queensland, um, a lot coming here. I think convenience is a massive one, Isa. Um, yeah. And also accessibility is big as well. Um, so thanks for that feedback, everybody. Um, and it is quite consistent with what we're seeing. So the three main responses that we got were cost effectiveness, convenience, and time. So um, I think everyone's on the same page there, which is great. Um, so it's very similar to last year. They all rated really they're fairly equally in terms of, as you can see there, 24, 28, 27% there as well. Um, however, we also ask people to elaborate on the responses as well, so why they are giving us um, you know, the percentages. We also wanted to know if there were any other, any other advantages, and this is also interesting because it's quite consistent with what people are saying. Um, having the ability to view content at a later date via on-demand recordings, which is also another advantage to people. Having access to a wider range of topics due to no, no ge geographical barriers, so once again just speaking to those in regional and remote locations, and having access to international presenters at any time of the day. Um, so they were the top three things that came through um, when people were elaborating on this response. Um, so it's really important to take this sort of thing into account when you are managing your online events because this is what the people are asking for. Um, we recommend, you know, through your promotional material and your marketing material, if you are going to record your webinar and host it on demand afterwards, let people know. Um, if you do have an international speaker coming in and they are really well known and they're an expert in the industry that you work in, make a big fuss of it and let people know that, you know, this person from in from an international location, the reason why you should attend this webinar is because it's convenient. This is what people are asking for. Um, so yeah, once again, when if you are even recording events, um, which we'll go into in a moment, always having some sort of strategy afterwards for how people can access that. Um, but interesting there to see either that we've got um, similar responses from everyone online as well, which is great. Yeah, definitely, lots of advantages there, but can you tell me some of the disadvantages? Yes, um, so there's always two sides to a coin. Um, and you know, once again, the responses were quite consistent with disadvantages. And I think this is probably one of the most important findings, um, and especially in terms of how we can help you guys run your online events. Time zone challenges was massive. And it's something that didn't even come up last year. So as an attendee joining an online event, if they're located in Queensland during um, daylight savings time, for example, the amount of people who said that people just don't communicate properly when they actually send out their details and their reminders and then they miss the webinar because of a simple mistake. Um, poorly conceived presentations with no interaction and too much content. Um, and I personally think this is the case in face-to-face -face events as well. Um, and that really plays into your presenter as well, which we'll also go into shortly. 
The lack of networking opportunities, which also didn't really come up last year as well. Um, so one of the things is people said they are online, um, but they miss out when you're in a face-to-face -face environment. You can actually have, um, you know, before the actual event happens, you have those networking drinks. Afterwards, you have those networking drinks. And while you're only taking an hour or so out of your time for these online events, there is a little bit of lack of um, humanity in some cases. Lateness and not sticking to the agenda. Um, so I think a few people who did complete the report were um, quite big on the fact that you know these events should start on time because it takes me two minutes to be distracted by, um, like Richard just said, emails or something coming in and then I'm gone and then someone on the other side of my desk is calling out to me. Then I've got a meeting and my time is precious. Um, and also agenda as well. A lot of people say they receive these invitations with a world of promises and they hop online and the presenter has goes completely off topic and they have no interaction. They have too much content, like we said earlier, um, and it just it just really, really prevents them from wanting to attend anymore. And then obviously the big one, technology failures, um, which I think is huge for everyone. Um, and I put my hand up as well. I've been on a few webinars where there have been a few technology issues and it's going to happen. Um, but people did say, obviously, it does play a major part. But if there is a plan B and if there is an easy fix and is, if there is communication throughout the webinar, then that's fine as long as you know stuff doesn't fall down and no one tells them what's happening and they have no idea what they're going to do next. Um, so they were the top five disadvantages of online events. Um, and I think for us as organisers and event planners and hosts, um, we need to do as much as possible to try and overcome these challenges because I think as um, the online space gets more competitive, um, it's going to be harder and harder and I think your attendees may be a little bit more ruthless. Um, so if an event fails, that's it. They're going to move on to something else. Um, so for time zone challenges, for example, um, what we've started doing now, and we do this for AUSAE as well, um, we include time zones for all capital cities uh, within the emails and also the registration pages. So when you receive your reminder or details email, you don't just have this webinar will be at one o'clock. You have, if you're in this state, the webinar will be at this time, this time, and this time. And then also including a link to timeanddate.com, um, which if you click on that, it will take you and you can actually convert the time yourself. Um, in terms of poor presentations, how do we overcome this? Um, and I think this is really briefing presenters. And I think for a long time now, people have really misunderstood the importance of your presenter um, and understanding that presenting face-to-face -face is completely different to online, especially if you have webcams involved. Um, so making sure that you know, you're the event organiser and they're the presenter, but at the end of the day, it is your event, so you are responsible for, you know, if you want interaction and if you want collaboration in your event, let them know. Um, providing them with a rehearsals beforehand to make sure that they get it right and make sure you're across everything that happens. Um, and being firm, I think some people tend to back down when it comes to their presenters. Um, lack of networking opportunities and we actually got some advice throughout this um, part of the um, session and people said, you know, people being able to utilise social media more, um, having Twitter integration within their um, webinars and their webcasts, for example. Um, one person actually came up with a great idea and I think sometimes you get some gold nuggets out of this sort of stuff. A pre-Q&A chat session, which is interesting. So. Um, that, that that would work. Yeah. yeah. So what we could have done, for example, um, and excuse us, we've been busy putting the report together, but next time we'll do it, um, is you know, for those of you who want to come online beforehand and chat to the presenter about any questions that you may have or the findings on a one-on-one -on -one basis, feel free to come online 20 minutes earlier. Um, and that way you can collaborate and connect with other people online as well. And then also um, forums afterwards. So um, if you have a panel of presenters or something, maybe you know the Q and A goes for too long and there's too many questions. So tell everyone to stay online and have a chat. Can't hurt. It's like being backstage, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I think so. And I think getting people involved from beginning, during, and end, it really stands out as well. It's not just sitting online looking at a PowerPoint and not being engaged with the presenter. Mm. Um, it can actually be quite powerful, I think. Um, so whoever's just going to be the first person to run that, I'm going to put a challenge out there to everyone online. If you host a webinar and manage to engage everyone before, during and after your event um, in some way, um, please let us know. Um, 
maybe we'll give a prize. We haven't thought about it yet. Yeah. Or we'll do a case study maybe or we'll be fun. really impressed. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then also lateness and not sticking to agenda. So usually you'd like to think that this could be fixed quite easily, um, but sometimes it can't be helped and once again, really brief your presenters. Um, utilising a facilitator like our wonderful eyes are here as well. So if I tend to go off track and move my hands around too much like I am right now, she can just give me that look and I can know that <laughs> it's okay. Um, and then also technology as well. So, you know, let's talk about Murphy's Law, it's going to happen. Um, always ensure that you've got as much backup as possible and you do have a plan B. Um, you have to have local support, you have to really be connected with your webinar provider as well and make sure that they know your goals and make sure that they know how important this is to you as well. We try and remove the burden from yourself. Um, and they're the disadvantages and how to overcome them. And just quickly, just Stephen, what platform do you suggest for pre and post forums? Um, I think this really depends on the type of event, um, especially it may be a hybrid event where you're running an annual conference um, and you're webcasting the event live, in which case there are private um, social networking um, forums um, and we're partnered with someone from there as well which I can provide your information with. Um, whereas if you are just doing one webinar a month, you can even just open up the webinar room early if you like and then have everyone stay on afterwards. Um, you could even use a Facebook group if you wanted to, um, but definitely look into some private social networking hubs out there. Um, Confinet is one of them who we work with. Um, but yeah, you can be really creative in terms of using anything um, free to you, the webinar platform or even go one step further with forums. Fantastic. Now, I think we should get a bit more positive now, Sarah. <laughs> I know, I feel like it's becoming a little bit negative. Um, <laughs> so we also ask people what makes um, their events enjoyable and not so enjoyable. And the response, responses sorry, were very similar from last year, weren't they, Sarah? Very similar. It was actually quite uncanny. Um, so content is massive. So we're asking people who have joined these events in the past, you know, what makes them enjoyable? What makes you be glued to your screen? And it's amazing because the responses that we get, this is the second year we've done it, is stuff that most of our webinar clients would never even think of and they just brush to the side and don't think it's important. Um, people come to us and say, okay, the presentation has to look really, really pretty and it has to look amazing. Um, and we have to interact with people throughout the entire webinar um, and we need to really have a facilitator. But people out there are saying that it's the content that really makes it enjoyable. Um, finding the right presenter as well, very consistent to last year, um, they can make or break it. Um, and obviously seamless technology is going to be up there as well. Um, so, you know, don't take this as gospel and think that, you know, it has, you need to focus, you know, 27% of your time on this and 24 on this. But what we recommend is just being mindful and making sure that you take all of these facets into play when you're planning your webinar. Um, you know, obviously you've got um, the technology as one part and then the ease of joining. So try and leave that to someone else to take care of. Try and leave that to the webinar people and make sure they're looking after it. Um, the content and the presentation, don't just palm it off to your, um, your presenter. Try and have a role in it and make sure, especially if you are running a regular series of webinars, that all your presenters are quite similar in the way they present. Um, and the presentation that they use is a template with your branding on it. Little things like that, I think, are going to appeal to your webinar audience um, if, they're, if they're glued to you and engaged with you um, as an association, especially. Um, but then, you know, we have to, sorry, Isa, we have to talk about the not so enjoyable as well. Um, and once again, you know, very, um, very interesting here, presenter number one. Um, so really, really get your presenters right. Um, you know, selecting the right presenter can make all the difference and that was a big reoccurring theme um, in this year's report. So, you know, if the presenter is making it less enjoyable, then obviously you can fix it up for your next one, um, but you have to take some learnings. Um, and having difficult technology is also going to place a burden on people. Um, people don't want to have to sit there, they're busy, they don't want to have to join a webinar and sit there for half an hour and try and download something and get their IT department involved. It's just going to be way too cumbersome um, and your members are just going to give up, to be honest, um, especially if you're delivering free events. Um, making it easy is definitely, definitely um, a big thing. Um, and once again, you know, it's about 
really engaging every single step of the webinar process. Um, and I'm sure most of you out there know there are planning stages um, and things that you need to do to get it right. But we just really um, you know, recommend getting all of these things right for the next one. Um, and don't be afraid to ask for help. You know, ask your webinar provider, um, the person who is helping you out, you know, what have other people been doing? What makes their webinar so great? You know, how do I increase attendance on mine? Um, obviously, they're working with these people on a regular basis. So try and filter as much knowledge out of them as possible. Fantastic. All right, now before we move on, just a reminder to our participants to keep the questions coming. Um, all right, now we are on to baggage, so please explain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we tend to find, um, you know, these are the questions that everyone wants to know the answer to. Um, they're so heavily influenced by past experiences and external factors, um, but it's, they're always great to know. Um, and once again, you know, unfortunately, we'll never be able to change people's perceptions if they have had a bad experience or they are carrying around experiences that have really tainted their experiences of webinars and webcasts. Their responses are going to be a little bit skewed, uh, but it's always great just to get an understanding of people out there. Um, and these are the fun ones as well. I tend to find. Um, so if we go on to webcams, yay or nay? Um, I think this one divides everyone, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. <laughs> yeah. So do they actually add anything to your online event or are they a distraction? Um, and this is going to also vary between your presenters. Um, so last, this year we saw a massive spike in those people admitting that they add nothing to the event, 41%. So that's a 19% increase from last year. So while everyone thinks, oh, we have to have a webcam, we have to have people um, you know, engage with the presenter and whatnot, 19% increase of people thinking that they don't think they're so great, um, that's pretty big. That's what we, yeah, that's what we like to think. Um, however, you've still got 40% out, people out there that do find that they um, add something to the event, while 19% are like, oh, I'm undecided, it doesn't really phase me. Um, so that's something to definitely take into account um, and this should definitely be planned with your um, webinar presenter because the last thing you want is someone online who's not comfortable no matter what and you're forcing them to present on a webcam and it just shows on the other side of the, of the screen, doesn't it? They just look awkward. And sometimes it does distract from the actual presentation as well. So if you do want your participants concentrating on it yes. then it's a good idea to sort of yes. not use it, right? Great. Yeah, I agree. Um, and you know, what a lot of people are doing now um, is really changing it up per event, we tend to find. Um, so each event you hold, each audience communicating to, uh, and each presenter is going to have a different opinion. So post-event feedback is a great way to collect people. Don't be afraid to ask, what did you think of the webcam? And if you have 80% of people come back and say, oh, do you know what, I thought it was really, really bad and it added nothing to the event, there you go, you've got your answer, don't use it for the next one. Um, but you know, in terms of some little things that you can do to actually um, you know, utilise webcams or maybe not utilise them if you want, you know, the best of both worlds, um, what people like to do now um, is activate the webcams for the beginning of the presentation, so the introduction. So Isa and I had our slide up with our pictures so you could get a you know, an understanding of who we are and put a face to the name and remove that technology barrier. Um, but you could have it on for the beginning. So Isa does the introduction, I come online, say hello to everybody and then just tell you all that we're going to focus on the presentation and turn them off. Um, then at the end for Q&A we can bring them back up um, and yeah, go from there. That's the best of both worlds we like to call it. Also consider bandwidth though. So someone at the beginning mentioned that you know webinars are great for having access to those in regional and remote locations, but those people don't necessarily have the best bandwidth. Um, or maybe you're in an office environment where you can only access wireless for the time you're conducting the webinar. Um, and one of the biggest things is you know you can have a webcam up, but if it's freezing and lagging and you know people are being pixelated, it's such a bad experience for those on the other end of the line. So if you are going to use them, make sure you've got the necessary technology requirements. Um, and you know, people have panel discussions as well, which is great. So we've got people who just run entire webinars with webcams, which is quite interesting, but that's the way they like to do it. Um, so you know, you can have a facilitator in the background using the cameras. Um, there's a functionality on this platform, our platform, that is an on-air, off-air, if you like, because you don't want to have a panel of people sitting there. You don't want to have one 
walking for 20 minutes and everyone else just staring into space or looking at their notes or turning their chair around. It can be really distracting. Um, so definitely think about the types of events you're running, think about the technology and think about mixing it up per event. Um, and then yeah, hopefully you'll come to some arrangement where every single event you hold um, is going to be perfect with the webcams, whether you have them or not. Um, another big question, and this is just a bit of fun again, and someone mentioned this before as well, which I think is great, and I love this question because I do it all the time. Have you ever secretly checked your emails while being online? But what we actually found is that a year makes an entire difference. So the majority of respondents of responses, um, respondents, sorry, admitted to checking their emails sometime at 61%. 38% admitted to always doing it. But last year, 90% admitted to always doing it. So I don't know, Isa, if people were just a little bit more honest last Maybe year. they're just taking webinars a bit more seriously now. Maybe it's just become a part of them. Maybe well, that's it's just... people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's one way of looking at it. Uh, but, you know, it, it's just a way of showing, you know, people do do this and it's a reality. Um, and if you're online, like I'm not sitting here thinking that no one else is doing anything, although, <laughs> um, but, you know, it's a reality. Um, but it's really important that you try and engage people as much as possible um, and that you're presented, you know, keep this in mind. Don't sit there and make it the be all and end all and scare them um, while they're online. Um, but make sure. Exactly, Carol, you're right. People, I've been um, at face-to-face -face events where people sit there on their iPhones and how distracting is that for a presenter? Um, so once again, just something, um, a little bit of fun and you know, it's just something to be aware of. Um, as a presenter and as a webinar organiser, you are going to have people online who aren't going to be as engaged but try and incorporate little things in here and there such as tools and um, you know, just little things here and there to make things easier for people to engage with you and your presenter online. Um, and the skills required to make a presenter memorable. Um, so here we've got a bit of a Walter White graph for you all. Um, now, you know, we all know that polished and engaging presenters are required to make online events enjoyable. We just saw that in the previous graph. Um, but what are the skills? Um, you know, people online who completed the survey obviously had been to many, many events before. So we wanted to really find out um, what they thought the skills were. Um, and once again, the same as last year, uh, last year, knowledge, enthusiasm and tone of voice were quite high. Um, personality also snuck in there as well. Um, but what's surprising is we've got your PowerPoint presentation at 12%, which is quite low when you take into account all the others. But once again, so many um, organisers and presenters we deal with make their PowerPoint presentation a be all and end all. And they talk about how great it has to be. And they talk about how, you know, oh, we need to give you the PowerPoint last minute because we're working on it. And they don't concentrate on anything else. They don't concentrate on, you know, the fact that they should be knowledgeable and be able to respond to questions. Or they don't concentrate on being enthused throughout the webinar because they're just worried about how people are going to perceive their PowerPoint presentation. Um, so really, really communicate these to your presenters um, and make them understand that, you know, them showing their personality and having passion and being enthused and knowing what's happening is just as important as the pictures and the words that are actually on the presentation. Day of the week. This is fun. <laughs> and there's always going to be a range of factors influencing this one. Um, but you know, this also depends on the industry you're in and your members as well. So um, it's going to obviously be skewed, um, but as we can see, We've got the Tuesday, Wednesday and Friday actually as the most popular days and we get this um, and think about yourself when um, you know people come to us and they say, oh, I'm going to start my, running my events and I don't know what day to have it, when should I have it? I don't know, how we... <laughs> <laughs> so if you ask the question, don't you? Again, ask the question and understand that all your members are different. Understand that people come into work and, you know, Monday morning they either need to have four coffees before they can be ready to go or Monday morning they come in and they've got so much to do. Um, you know, maybe Fridays are great for people because, you know, after the hours of 
you know, between the hours of two to five, they've maybe had a few drinks at lunchtime and they want to sit back and relax. Um, and then Bonnie, you know, our members like weekends, whereas people who completed the survey didn't mention weekends in there. Um, so it really does depend. Um, and always, always consider your audience and we can't really stress us. Um, and Carol, after hours sessions, great. Um, really, really, once again, survey. Use surveys. Don't be afraid to ask your members because they're the ones that are actually going to be attending and they're the ones that are going to make your series a success. Um, and you know, just going on to Bonnie's point, if we move forward, time of day as well. Um, you know, work in early childcare so I can't leave children to do a webinar. Exactly. So mid-morning was just as popular last year. It was the highest ranking one as well. Um, and Carol, you talk about after hours sessions and so many of our webinar um, clients do after hours sessions because that's what their members prefer because they are on their feet all day and they're not necessarily um, you know, in front of a computer because they may be physiotherapists or they may be doctors or they may be anything out there. Um, so they don't have access to a computer between the computer between these hours. Um, so once again, not taking this as, you know, oh, we all have to do our webinars between the hours of 10 and 11 because that would be completely boring and we'd all have no time to attend everyone's webinars. Um, but really understanding that these are important factors that people are going to be looking for when they are looking to register for your webinar or not. Um, and just being really, really cautious um, of your audience and their wants and their needs when attending your online events. Great, so speaking of importance, I think we should compare 2013 to 2014 and see whether or not what was important is still important. We're also going to launch some more some more polls, sorry, so uh, please join us. So go on, Sarah. Yes, okay, and any more questions, feel free, because this is the last section, and then we'll move on to questions. Um, so important or not, um, we asked our respondents to rate how important they feel the following aspects of web conferences, webinars, and webcasts are. So these were the same questions as last year, so we're going to do a bit of a comparison. Um, so the registration process is easy and seamless. So I'm going to launch a poll here. So everyone online, my lovely online audience, how important do you think the registration process is? Do you think it's extremely important? Do you think it's somewhat important and you know it's something you need to have but it doesn't have to be the be all and end all? Or do you think it's not important at all? Um, and obviously think of other factors that we're going to ask here, um, you know, in, in terms of priorities, I guess. Um, but we can see that 96% of people so far are telling us that they think the registration process is easy and seamless. Now, if we actually close that poll, for the 30 of you who said that, um, and we look at the responses, so very similar responses to last year. 70 people said it is extremely important. And then 30% of people said it was somewhat important. One thing said it's not important as well. Um, so it is apparent that this aspect, you know, in 2013 and 2014 is important to people and shouldn't be overlooked. Um, so in terms of recommendations, um, ensure that you make it easy for people to register to your event and keep it consistent. Um, if you're running webinars on a monthly basis and you have people register one way the first month and then the second month you change it up, it's going to play with people's minds a little bit, I think. Um, and you know, if you have a webinar series, you know, create a banner or something so everyone knows that when they receive an email and they go to your website, that's your webinar program, um, and that's a seamless registration process, and it's consistent, and it's easy, and people aren't going to want to mind. Um, if you have a registration process where it takes people, you know, two three minutes to complete a form, um, it's not going to be a nice experience. Um, and as we can see here, not one single person said that it wasn't important. Um, so definitely even, you know, play around with your registration process and test it with um, other people in your workplace and say, okay, if you want to register, can you pretend to register for this uh, webinar that I'm holding and let me know how easy and seamless it is. Or do it, you know, with your people you live with or your, your partner or something. Get them from an outsider to register and get their feedback on it and mix it up a bit. Okay, the next one, drum roll. Okay, how important is it that the event that you're holding sticks to the timing and agenda? So we'll launch this poll to get your feedback. 
Is it extremely important? Is it somewhat important? Or is it not important at all? And you know, as long as everyone's happy online and they're just you know wasting the hour of their time. <laughs> Great, so as you can see here, people don't actually think that this is as important as the registration process, which is um, interesting, even though it is only a small amount of people. Um, but we've got these responses now. So 75% of you think that this is extremely important. Um, now this is probably one of the biggest shocks from last year. So we've already seen throughout the report, people are saying this when we're asking them to elaborate that it's important. But you know, we look at last year, 2013, and 62% of people said that it was somewhat important. And now we've only got 9% of people. Um, you know, 91% of people say that this is extremely important to them. Um, like I said, they, there are a lot of webinars out there now. There's a lot of content, which is free, that people can go online and get in terms of education. Um, so it's important that if people are dedicating half an hour, an hour, in some cases we run events where people are running events for three hours, that you say what you, you do what you say you're going to do. Um, so just remember that, and yeah, it is interesting to see that people actually did think that the registration page was more important. Um, let's move on. So we've done the event six time and agenda. Let's talk about feedback, and we have mentioned feedback a lot today, haven't we, Isa? Yeah. We're big on the feedback. Um, <laughs> so we talk about you know people afterwards um, after you have your online event, the importance of capturing their feedback, tailoring your webinar program, providing it to your presenters so they can improve, um, and also just understanding what people's wants and needs are. Um, you know, for a webinar, redirecting people to an exit page and asking them how they thought the webinar was, or using in-room surveys, we think is very important. Um, but let's see how important you guys think it is. Um, do you think that the fact that people's feedback is captured and then taken on board is as important as your registration pages? and the agenda of your conference. Wow, 50-50. Mm, Interesting. Close, yeah. Yes. Um, ta -da. So, you know, we've all said it. You know, there's no point in capturing feedback if you aren't prepared to do anything with it. Um, however, it's obvious that it's not as much of a priority for people out there. Mm. Um, I think personally, from our experiences with webinars, it's more important for us as presenters and as host to capture that feedback as opposed to me as an, as an attendee. I'm going to provide you with my feedback straight away and you know, I appreciate that but it's not the main thing that I'm worried about. I'm more concerned with how much I learned from the webinar. I'm more concerned about how I'm going to apply this knowledge as opposed to whether my feedback is taken on board. Um, so very consistent I think with everyone online here now. And you know, we can see for the first time 16% of people are saying that it's not important at all. Um, so once again, definitely collect the feedback. But you know, if you are getting feedback from people and it is necessarily um, negative at some stage, you know, maybe respond to them. Um, and if it is necessarily positive in some stage, maybe respond to them as well. But don't think of it as, oh my God, my event's over because someone didn't like it. Um, because you're always going to get, you know, one end of the scale, another end of the scale. Okay. How important is it, Isa, that the event is recorded and made available at a later date? So we'll launch this poll. Um, and this is really just recording the event, as we're doing now, um, making it accessible afterwards as well. So, I don't think we had this one here, did we? No, we didn't have this yeah. poll, sorry guys. <laughs> We're now just going to skip straight to the results. Um, so how important is it? Somewhat important, 33%. Extremely important, 67%. And this is something to take what you will. Um, and I think it really depends on your presenters. A lot of presenters don't like being recorded. Um, we find recording our at all of our events, no matter what. And as you can see, no one said that it's not important to them. And the reason for that is because you are going to have on a free event around a 50% attendance rate. And 50 to 60%, if you have any higher, you're doing incredibly well. Um, so how are you then, especially as a membership benefit, going to provide the people that didn't attend? 
with this information? Um, you know, do you have an online library where as a membership benefit you have your people go into and say, okay, as a member, not only do you have access to our free webinars, but you also have access to a whole content bank where you can access information that's been um, projected to previous mem um, members, members for the past 12 months. Um, so always recording that. Um, we even use it for our search engine optimization reasons. Um, you know, having video online is incredibly important to us as a company in terms of our brand awareness and letting people know that we're educators and we're thought leaders um, and we do have great presenters. So it can also be a selling tool as well. So think about those who can't attend, think about the membership benefit and then also think, it as, think of it as a way to increase um, and engage those people who aren't necessarily members yet. Okay. Now, this is the last one we're going to. Um, okay, I just want to get before I go into this, and you can maybe read amongst yourselves for a moment into Sue's question. So, if attending for PD points, how do you verify actual attendance, not log in and walk away? And that's a great question. And there are a few Big Brother tools. Um, I won't actually show you now, but I'll let you know. One of them is um, polling. So the polling that we've been using, some of our clients actually launched a secret poll at random intervals throughout and don't let people know. Um, and then there's also um, a presence manager as well which pops up randomly throughout the webinar. So you can set that to pop up um, every two minutes or every 20 minutes if you like. The person actually clicks on that and it may come up and say, um, are you here? Or click if you are present. And if people click on that and you only have it up for say five seconds, then you can actually track who's online. So it is a little bit sneaky in the way that it works. Um, but yeah, it is one of those things. It is very difficult to um, confirm whether people are even paying attention, if you like. Uh, but there are a few little tools that you can use and you can incorporate to make it easier. So I hope that helps, Sue. <laughs> um, this is the wish list. Um, and this is just a, with a condensed version. Um, so we ask people, you know, what is your wish, wish list? As people who regularly attend these online events, um, what are the things that, you know, what are the things that you wish that you could have? What would make your perfect webinar or your perfect webcast? Um, and you know, we're going to go through these now um, and we're also going to just launch the survey at the same time, which is a way to collect feedback, as we both just mentioned. Um, and you know, this would just help you guys just, as you're listening to us speak, um, just provide some feedback for AUSAE on the right hand side. So dynamic speakers who convey knowledge and messages with clarity, really important to people. And it seems as though, um, from what we can see from the results, is a few people haven't actually had the best experiences with presenters. So um, once again, definitely should be on your priority list. Interaction with the speaker prior to the webinar, so a pre-blog session or Q&A. Um, some of the things we do in the emails that we send out, uh, we ask people if they have a pre-question even, and say if you have a pre-question, please feel free to submit it, um, and that way you can interact with the presenter beforehand and not just randomly see them on the day. Reliability of event organisers and responsiveness to technical glitches. Um, so if you are promoting an event three weeks out and people respond to your details or reminder emails and ask you questions, you know, you're getting back to them with responses, um, making sure that you're letting them know what's actually happening if they have any questions and communicating with them before the webinar. Um, and then also online responding to technical glitches as well. Follow up. Um, so we always provide follow up documents. Um, so we also, if a lot of people out there, and it depends once again on the type of events that you're promoting and it also depends on your audience. Um, we send the recording out as well as a summary um, of any documents that we've spoken about as well as a PDF. Um, you know, if you have too many questions coming through, how are you going to follow up with those? Are you just going to leave them and leave all your attendees in the dark? Or are you going to have your presenter complete those questions and give them a week to do it and then send out the responses to everyone online? That's another way to do it. Um, you know, people were saying, Board meetings and internal meetings should be done online. You know, it can sometimes be the worst subject ever, but it's one that needs to be covered. And to, you know, people shouldn't just think of these as educational um, events. Using the webcam for introduction, but not necessarily the entire event, which is what we also covered. Um, meaningful content 
can, which is accessible at a later date. Um, and I think one thing that, you know, just to add to this is having evergreen content, so the content that lasts for a long period of time and doesn't necessarily cut off, you know, it's you know, not um, accessible or not meaningful within a few months' time. Um, and, you know, obviously you may use um, online events to communicate maybe um, legislation or changes in the way things are happening. But having that content that is available, so if I watch it in January 2013 and I watch it in 2014 January, it's still going to be relevant to me as well and I can still access it. So maybe think about having a few of those little, um, little golden gems, especially for people who are coming new into your organisation as members. Um, meaningful slide presentations and the ability to respond and have questions at the end. Um, we've just spoken about many content, um, question time, structure, and two or more presenters, um, which is what we've got here. I find it much better even as a presenter, having Isa in the room to bounce ideas off her and not talk to a PowerPoint. Um, and I think your presenters may find that quite good as well. Um, there's nothing worse than not getting that feedback from somebody instantaneously. Um, there's nothing worse, like I said, just staring at a blank screen and not knowing how you're going and not being able to see people's facial expressions. Um, so once again, um, just a little bit of a summary of what people are wanting um, and hopefully that will make some sense and give you, give you some advice on how you can maybe um, start your online event program with some tips and tricks um, or maybe even mix things up a bit um, and try something new. Um, there's always time to do that. Um, and that wraps it up, Isa. That covers it. Um, so I believe we don't have any more questions coming yeah, through. Yeah, we don't. So if anyone do. does. Yeah, <laughs> if anyone does, please type them in now. Um, I'll just... Um, I'll, yeah, I'll just do a bit of a wrap up, just yeah. a summary. Yeah. Um, and, you know, for those of you online, hopefully you have had um, some, you know, insights and inspiration from um, what other people out there are wanting as webinar attendees. Um, you know, we will actually send you a copy of the report within the follow-up um, email within 48 hours. So that will also contain a link to the recording as well as the PowerPoint and the report itself. Um, but yeah, enjoy it. Enjoy the journey. Um, enjoy mixing things up again and learning um, from your online events. And I really hope that you've all had um, like I said, some inspiration from today. And I'll leave it to Isa to wrap up um, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Sarah. And thanks, everyone, for joining today's webinar. We hope you found the event inspiring and the technology easy to use. If you would like any additional information on how to host your own webinars, please feel free to contact us directly. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. Bye.